Hi, my name is Kuljit Bamra, composer, producer and musician. In this episode, I will be explaining simply and clearly the underlying principles of Indian rhythms and percussion performance, especially when it comes to Indian classical music. Now, you may ask, is it necessary to understand music in order to enjoy it? Obviously not. But if you're someone who would like to learn an Indian instrument or Indian drums as a hobby or as a pastime or even professionally, I think the world of Indian music and performance can be very confusing for a first time student. So I'm going to break down very simply Indian rhythms and what performers actually do when they are performing rhythms be it in a solo recital or with an accompanist. Uh, if I can share something from my own personal experience, I remember when I was 11 years old, my parents took me to London, uh, especially in the train, and we went to watch a concert of a very famous tabla player that had come from India to perform. And uh, I mean, at that time, I could already play simple rhythms that I picked up on my own. My mother is a well-known community singer and community figure, and so I accompanied her for, for four or five years since the age of six in Sikh temples and also at social gatherings. So I could already play some simple patterns. Um, but my parents wanted to help me expand my playing skills and knowledge by taking me to this concert. I have to say I was totally impressed and wowed by the concert. And a few years afterwards, I began to reflect on that moment. And I realized that what really was magical about that concert was the speed at which the tabla player was playing and the complexity of the rhythms that he was playing. Now, I didn't actually know what he was doing <laughs> on stage. Um, I, you know, there was no music that he was playing because I remember when I was at school, uh, and I was learning to play the recorder. I think we all have had some a similar experience. <laughs> and uh, I, had, uh, I had my instrument, my recorder, and then I also had a book with music in it. So there were two separate sort of departments, so to speak. There was the department or the world of playing the instrument, where to put your finger, how to make a sound and which notes to play. Then there was a, a world of music to play. And it very quickly dawned upon me that Indian musicians didn't have sheet music in front of them. They were making up music on the spot, it seemed to me, um, and being spontaneous in that moment. But I didn't really know what the thinking behind that was. Uh, when did they become spontaneous and when did they decide to play a simple pattern? Um, what was the intention of the improvisation? What was it doing and what was the reason for it? So I had all these questions that remained unanswered for many, many years. And I began to do further explorations myself to try and find out the answers to those questions. Okay, so let's have a look under the bonnet, so to speak, of Indian rhythms and the way that Indian rhythms are performed on stage. In the traditional way of learning, which is known as parampara, which is quite a nice word to say, <laughs> and parampara is basically an Indian word for pedagogy and the transmission of knowledge from one person to another. And in the traditional setting, you would learn an instrument from your teacher. In India, the word for teacher is guru. Again, I think guru in the West is a heavily loaded word. And uh, many people think that guru is somebody who is an expert on life or divinity, not just a simple teacher. But in fact, guru means teacher. You would sit face to face with your guru and your guru will teach you rhythm patterns. And your job eventually is to really mimic or copy your guru. The learning process is totally oral, so it's a spoken tradition. One thing in the Indian tradition is that there is no written music. There is no repertoire that's written in a universal manner that everybody can understand, um, that it's passed down. It is, it is totally done by memory 
and by memorizing patterns that you learn to speak. So the downside of that is if you've got a bad memory, then, <laughs> then you're in trouble. Secondly, the spoken sounds are very difficult to say if you're not Indian. Da, ge, tu, na. Titikata tu, na. Da, ge, tu, na. Titikata tu, na. Now, that's difficult to speak, let alone play. So that again is another layer and another potential barrier that pushes people away. But anyway, coming back to how it's taught, you would learn patterns by speaking them and then memorizing them. And then you would learn patterns of improvisation and methods of improvising around those patterns. Now, let's talk a little bit about the rhythms themselves. And the rhythms in India, or I'm going to call them rhythmical cycles because that's technically what they are, are called tala or tal. If you're in the north of India, tal is more common. In southern India, where Sanskrit is still very predominant in um, the spoken language, you would call it tala, just as you would call in the north of India the melodic uh, side of music, rag, and in south India, raga. But they're the same thing. And a tala is a pattern of rhythm that is designed to be cyclic. We're going to talk about that in a minute, but let's look at some patterns. And the patterns are divided into subdivisions. Now, on the screen, you'll see a system that I use um, very often to teach Indian rhythms, and it's a system called houses and triangles. A triangle represents three beats, and a house represents two beats. All rhythmical patterns and cycles can be written using houses and triangles. And it's quite an easy way to understand um, rhythmical cycles and patterns by putting it into a simple visual format as well as something that your brain can understand easily. So let's take um, a cycle called Japtal, which is a 10 beat cycle. You will see it on the screen right now, and it's divided this way. One, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three. Let's look at another one. A very simple pattern, a six beat cycle called Dadra Tal. Now, you'll begin to realize many Indian rhythm cycles are over four or five beats in length. And the reason for that is the longer they are, the more of a shape they have. And when I say shape, I mean a sort of personality. It's, it's, it's like a structure. If you think of sculpting a brick or um, molding clay, the, the more you have, the more you can create in terms of nuance and shape. If I, if I think of a two beat cycle, it's quite difficult to create a, a personality or a shape out of two beats because that's all I've got. I could create something out of the performance, but the actual cycle itself is a very small brick, so to speak. Let's have a look at a pattern called Rupak Tala. It's one of my favorites. And it's a seven beat cycle divided into three and two twos. So a triangle and two houses. A very common cycle used in Indian classical music is Teen Tala which is 16 beats and is divided into four groups of four. And that's very common in Indian classical music, again, because of the length of the cycle, it gives more scope for improvisation, which we're going to talk about in a minute.
Now, I'm not going to go through all the cycles. There are many cycles in Indian music. And the beauty of cycles and naming those particular cycles is that when you're performing with a musician that perhaps you haven't met before or haven't practiced before with, you could just say, this song's in Tintal or this song's in Rupaktal or this song's in Japtal, and that person will know exactly what you're talking about and you're on the same page immediately. Now, what's the beauty of a cyclic rhythm? If you think of pop music or dance music, generally in 4-4, four, four. Uh, in folk music you may have a, um, a reel in 4-4, four, four. you may have a jig, you may have a 6-8 rhythm, but the rhythms are cyclic because you want the listener to be able to predict what's going to happen. Why? Because most likely you want them to dance to the music or you want them to clap along. So, for that reason, the music must have a predictable future or an expectation in the listener's mind. Now, in Indian classical music and in recitals, which are taking place normally in a concert venue or a sit-down theatre, you don't want people to dance, <laughs> nor do you want people to clap along. So, the use of a cycle there is different. And how it's different is that Setting up a cyclic structure means you can improvise over it. So once you've created a template for rhythmical cycle and melodic cycle by the other musician, you have then created a sort of expectation or a predictable future in the audience's mind that you can then play around with, so to speak. And Indian musicians are masters of playing around with cycles. So that's where the complexity comes in. So setting up a cycle, rhythmically and melodically, the players then have a scope to step outside of the cycle, almost look like they've got lost in a particular way, but they haven't they will very masterfully come back and step back into the cycle and land on the downbeat. So the downbeat is very important in Indian music. There are many words, which I'm not going to go through each one of them right now, to address approaches of how to improvise. And you would spontaneously improvise on stage, but you would call upon the resource of your knowledge and repertoire of oral tradition that you've learned from your teacher. So I'm going to demonstrate uh, one for you right now and um, I will just uh, play Rupak Tala which is a seven beat cycle and then I will step outside of the cycle um, and make it look like I'm sort of getting lost in a way but I'm not. Uh, and then I will come back and enter the downbeat um, without having lost my way, so to speak. So, five, six, seven. There's something called a tihai, which is a bit like a triple somersault, so to speak, musically. And what you would do is you would repeat a phrase three times and land on the downbeat of the cycle. Usually in Indian classical music, the performances end with a tihai. And it's very wowing and thrilling. But there are also tihais and other ways of... Um, wandering off the path of the cyclic uh, journey and then coming back on. And that's what you learn 
with your teacher. And that's what Indian classical musicians focus on predominantly in their performances. So I hope that's been useful to you and helpful. And I do hope that next time you go to watch an Indian classical recital, you will have a deeper understanding, perhaps, and appreciation of the music. Thank you very much for watching.